Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on iDagio. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and I'm your host of the series. For those of you joining us for the first time today, my series here, I'm meeting with weekly guests who are really, who really inspire me, people who are, are truly visionaries in the classical music genre. And, and I'm asking them what goes into, into their artistic philosophy and, and their approach to, to pushing the boundaries and thinking outside the box in this genre. And today I am so honored to be joined by Marc-André Amna. Marc-André almost goes without introduction. He is one of the foremost musicians of our time. He is celebrated for his, his astoundingly vast repertoire, um, from uncovering these rare and obscure masterpieces from the 19th and 20th century and bringing them into light, to, um, to masterful interpretations of Schubert, Chopin, Liszt, Brahms. His recording discography extends to over 60 albums. Uh, he records exclusively with the Hyperion label. He's been nominated for 11 Grammys. He's the recipient of the Echo Classic Instrumentalist of the Year Award. Um, and he performs worldwide with major, all, of, all of the major orchestras and the major concert venues. Um, and as well as this, uh, as a composer, he's celebrated for his compositions and they are also performed worldwide. So with great pleasure, please welcome Marc-André Amna. Hi, Marc-André. Hi, it's such a, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. So nice to have you here. Um, so Mark andre I'd like to begin by asking my guests the question, what was the first, what was your first encounter with music? And was there a specific musical moment which inspired your lifelong quest or a passion for music? Well, that's very easy to answer. It was, uh, it was really my dad. I don't think I would be able to not not be, being able to. Well, I I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing uh, if I hadn't had that in, initial inspiration of him uh, seeing him play because he was a very good amateur pianist. Although he was a pharmacist by trade, uh, his real love was music, and uh, he really had quite uh, a talent. And the remarkable thing is that it came of uh, it came out of absolutely nowhere because his parents were not musicians at all. Um, but uh, he became quite proficient at piano playing. And also he had uh, two years uh, where he studied the organ, although he, he gave that up. But it uh, uh, exposed him to uh, another kind of repertoire, which was nice. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it was his wish that uh, one of his two children, I have an older sister, um, would uh, maybe do what he, eventually chose not to do uh, because he decided against the career I think I think really really quite early on um, um, so both my sister and I started uh, piano lessons at the same time um, I started after uh, he's uh, he asked me you know whether I wanted to because he saw that I was very interested in you know, whenever he was playing you know I'd just go to the piano and stare at him open-mouthed uh, so uh, to, to him, that was a definite sign you know, that something may happen, might happen. And uh, I started, you know, along with my sister, like any, like anybody else, you know, with the, with the most elementary kind of uh, uh, teaching, you know, method. But it became clear uh, over time that I, I was I was developing much more rapidly than she was, and uh, I'm, I have to give her a lot of credit for not being too frustrated. Um, uh, well, I guess she was, you know, but uh, she stuck with it for three years, you know, before she finally gave it up. But I, I, I was uh, from the start a really rather quick learner, you know, and that that was an encouraging sign. And uh, you know, I I always enjoyed uh, when I look back at it, the fact that uh, my father was always playing a lot of records at home, you know, besides playing himself, and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't necessarily piano. I mean, it, it, I remember Tchaikovsky's ballet music, for example, which I really grew up on. And uh, the obvious suspects like Carnival of the Animals and Peter and the Wolf, which are geared mm -hmm. towards, and other things like that. You know, although he did play a lot of records of uh, uh, piano repertoire as well, so I got familiar with that. And I have to thank him for uh, the fact that uh, I became, through all of this, uh, familiar with a good chunk of the basic piano repertoire really rather early. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and since I've always been a, of a very curious nature, you know, I soon wanted to explore something else. And that's what eventually got me into looking at other avenues and, and uh, lesser played repertoire. Uh -huh. Wow, wonderful. Um, I mean, so you have recorded a, a great deal of, of, of obscure repertoire. And I read that in part this was because of, of your father and him also having this fascination and and you're really a champion for bringing so much of this to light. And I'm curious what compelled this fascination or rather what sort of nurtures that? Because it seems that it's not just, it didn't happen just when you were beginning as an artist, but it's it's a continued, uh, continued. It's, it's uh, partly or maybe in a large measure, uh, natural curiosity. Uh, I, there's always been a, a, a good part of me that wants to, just to find out more. Uh, what what is what more is there? And uh, the more you delve into the piano repertoire, you realize that it's it's a horn of plenty, because the piano is by far the instrument for which it, it, most music has been written. The, mo the most music has been written. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is forgettable. A lot of it hasn't uh, stood the test of time. There's always possibilities for revivals, you know, but uh, by and large, uh, uh, certain kinds of music are of a certain period and, uh, and should perhaps stay there. Um, there's a large part of it, of course, which is uh, not very good or plain bad, let's say it. Um, but uh, the fun, the fascination is really about trying to find the nuggets and uh, what really does deserve revival. And, um, well, what, what can I say? I mean, I, I, I think I've done my bit and I will continue to, to, to do my bit, but uh, part of the reason also why I've done it is to encourage other people to do the same. Yes. That's why I've recorded a lot of this repertoire. I mean, it's not it's not really necessarily for myself. I, I'm I, I'm I'm not really directly looking for my own glory here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it has helped my career to a certain extent. But uh, what I would really like is to uh, encourage other pianists to be more adventurous. And to be fair, I think that uh, uh, a lot of young pianists are looking past. The, the the standard repertoire. I mean, if if you look at um, how many more young pianists today are playing Nicolai Metner or Charles Valentin Alcan uh, or people like that, and go, and even Leopold Godofsky, uh, uh, I, I I perhaps have played a part in that. I mean, there have been others, you know, but uh, to me that's very satisfying that there is more and, and more of a, of a looking towards that kind of repertoire with young people. Yes, absolutely. Um, as as a composer, I've read that you you've composed um, you compose largely away from the piano. Is that, um, it, or rather, you compose the etudes away from the piano? And I was wondering, um, first of all, why? And um, do you ever do you ever not compose away from the piano? Do you ever compose at the piano? Actually, I I do. I, I, I would say at least 98% of, of my composing away from the piano. That is true. Mm -hmm. Because I find that I can think more clearly. Uh, and I am not influenced by the pianism of it. Um, I, I try to figure that out on my own, away from the instrument. Um, hopefully knowing enough about what the physical result of what I write will be. Um, although I've made mistakes, uh, a lot of those early etudes that I wrote, uh, I, I, I just tell myself, I can't believe I did that because uh, they are, some of them are so difficult that I, I can't imagine that <laughs> anybody would have the courage to, 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 to um, but I, at the time, you know, when I was, was writing these really difficult things, I, uh, was so satisfied with the musical result that I didn't want to change anything. Nowadays, I think that uh, as I've gained more experience composing, I, uh, I could 
do the same thing without the result being so difficult, you know, because I could, I could change certain things. I mean, who knows, I, I, I may revise those etudes at some point uh, to, to make them more accessible, you know, because musically I was, I was satisfied with them. Um, and so it, for you, it's the clarity that you get from sitting away from the piano that compels you the most to be, perf to be composing. Yeah, I, um, I, I have to say that I always have to check myself. I have to check my work at the piano mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes I can find that I didn't hear the texture right or that sometimes uh, harmonic progressions don't actually work the way I th thought they would. Uh, but that has gotten better over time. Uh, it used to be that I would... Um, uh, I would write something and get to the piano and it wasn't at all what I'd imagined. So uh, I, I had to start uh, back from zero and oh, wow. okay. get something out of what I'd written or scrap it and, uh, and just, uh, just do it another way or something yeah. completely different. Yeah. But uh, as, as you gather experience, that happens less and less, fortunately. Right, of course. I'm curious, um, as a performer, do you feel, a, I'm curious what the feeling is um, in comparing when you're performing your own work to when you're performing um, a work of another composer. What's, what's the difference in that feeling for you? Well, it's much clearer what I want when I'm performing my own, uh, own pieces. And I'm, as far as my wishes, I'm pretty specific. Um, with uh, with the, the composers of the so-called standard literature, composers of the past, there's always plenty of open questions because the system of notation that we all have to employ is so imperfect and is so open to discussion and interpretation that there, that there will always be a lot of divergences between interpreters. Um, and this is the perfect time to open a parenthesis about uh, the work that I was uh, asked to write for the uh, 2017 Clyburn competition, mm -hmm. which was a, uh, a toccata on uh, L'Homme Armé, which is a, a, a famous medieval tune. Um, in the past incarnations of the competition, uh, only semi-finalists had been asked to perform the uh, the imposed piece, you know, the, the piece written specially for, for the comp competition. But th this time, the rules changed completely, and every one of the pianists uh, at the beginning of the competition was required to play it. So that's 30 people. So I got 30 premieres out of the thing. <laughs> um, of course, uh, <laughs> before the competition, my my greatest worry was, okay, everybody's going to get sick of it after hearing it 30 times, even though the piece is only four and a half minutes long. Uh, so, um, but apparently that didn't happen from what I from what I heard. And the, uh, this whole thing was the greatest learning experience for me. I mean, I wish that any composer would get that to to have 30 different performances of a work. <sighs> Uh -huh. uh, it taught me a great deal as to uh, uh, performers' perceptions of uh, a piece of musical notation and how it can be interpreted, misinterpreted, mm -hmm. and even disregarded in certain cases. Um, I can't blame those who disregarded some of my indications because it's a natural tendency. I've done it myself. Yes, right. I'm, I'm guilty. And I think a lot of us probably have, because we know better than the composer, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, I expected that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, all, all, all of these uh, performances were never less than very good. I mean, the, the piece was not difficult enough that uh, the, the, uh, any passage was ever fudged or uh, or uh, resulted in disaster, and I'm very happy to say that. Uh, and I and I kept count, and 21 out of the 30 competitors, and that's a full 70 percent, memorized. Mm -hmm. it actually, took the trouble to memorize it. And it's it, harmonically, it is not a simple piece. Uh, fortunately, it was pianistic enough, you know, that uh, 
uh, uh, usually um, I, I, across the board, you know, the result was really very good, you know, and uh, and pianistically it was understood. And uh, I I don't think that anybody really, really complained about it pianistically, which is good. That's also good. <laughs> um, were there any interpretations that surprised you? I mean, I suppose, of course, everyone in a way could surprise you with an interpretation if it's but were there any what that kind of went against maybe in a way what you'd written, but it but it surprised you in a in a good way or well nothing was really out of the uh, outside the realm of uh, what I had imagined. I mean, uh, what I was looking most for the most actually was that they would get the right character. Of course, I mean, it, it 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 it's. It's understood that one should get the right notes, you know, because uh, especially because harmonically the, the piece was really quite intricate, as I said. But what I was looking for was I, I wanted the, the, the character. The, the, the sort of, because it, it's kind of, uh, it, it, it's supposed to sound a little anxious, but kind of urgent, not without nobility, but uh, still urgent in my mind. And I think that most people got that. Uh, there were quite a few performances that were too fast even though I, I, I had a very clear metronome marking. Again, that's something that's very tempting to disregard. And I, I, in a way, I can't, I can't blame these young people. But uh, it was, as I said, it was never less than very good. And as far as a learning experience for me, there was nothing like it. And I don't mm. think it will ever be like it. Wow, that's, that's really, really fantastic. I'm, I'm so curious as a, as a pianist, as such an active uh, performer and composer as yourself, how do you balance the two? And you do, in terms of just time, and do you go through certain periods of time where you don't compose or where you just perform or, or vice versa? Yeah, I like remember uh, after finishing, um, uh, I actually wrote another piece before this for a, a competition. It was the ARD competition in Munich in 2014. And I remember very clearly after finishing that, not writing music for a whole year. Oh, and wow. for me, that's kind of normal because I, I am first and foremost, you know, uh, a performing artist. And, uh, and uh, composing for me is vital. Uh, it is necessary in many respects, but it will never be in the forefront of my musical activities. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, it, this, it, it's a, kind of thinking about the competition um, makes me think about, um, there's an interview on the Hong Kong public broadcasting service of you. It's a video interview and it's really, it's really, it's, it's quite a wonderful interview. You talk very um, eloquently about the, the universe of the piano and, and then something else that you speak about in the interview is, um, is the, how the word virtuosity can get mislabeled. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's something that I started to think about, about how, well, exactly what you say. We, we've kind of lost the idea of what virtuosity really means um, in that it should be an all encompassing word about art and about emotion and psychology. And yeah, I was wondering if Absolutely. you could maybe talk a little bit about what, whether you feel there are any kind of dangers in labeling virtuosity the way we label it now. Well, it is it is a misnomer uh, because uh, virtuosity is actually a, a, a more noble kind of concept than uh, p uh, how people generally understand it. Um, virtuosity, to me, is um, it, it's sort of a, a, a heightened ability to use one's resources, where, uh, be they artistic or corporal. So uh, mental or physical, I guess, <clears throat> into uh, uh, realizing an artistic concept and, and giving it form and shape. Um, I think these abilities are inborn, although they, uh, they, they can undoubtedly be uh, sharpened and cultivated over time. Um, but nowadays, uh, people understand virtuosity mostly as, as uh, sort of a tightrope, a walking kind of thing and uh, and um, uh, basically a circus act. And, and there are a, a number of young people who, who uh, really 
you know, make it make it a specialty to play as fast as they can. Um, I was guilty of this for quite a while. I didn't quite realize what I was doing, I think. And when I listen to some of my past recordings and past performances, uh, sometimes I'm appalled. Uh, and I've discovered, perhaps a little late, that uh, it is so wonderful to just slow down and smell the flowers. Um, I don't know how else to say it, really, because... No. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I've discovered that pacing is, is more and more and more important because uh, it, it's basically that you have to think about the listener. I, I, I mean, one should do ev everything, you know, as a musician about the listener. I mean, it's not about being on stage, about the glory being on stage. You are there to share, you're there to, 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 to expose what a miracle art is and music mm -hmm. is and um the act of sharing for me is everything and um i'm not interested to be on stage you know just to exhibit myself yeah it's an interesting subject thinking about the listener because we have so many different kinds of listeners now i mean when you think about we have the musical the ed, uh, musically educated listener and the um, you know, the listener that's your great aunt who grew up listening to the Beatles or something. And do you, do you, uh, I mean, what, what do you think of when you think of the listener? I mean, I, it just made me suddenly think about a quote of Arau who said, you know, you always have to play for the ideal listener. That was, that was something that always stuck with me. And is that, is that something that you think about as, you as know, well? In a way, yes, because uh, 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 there's something uh, nice about the thought of bringing the listener up to what you're trying to express. Although uh, everybody is listening in a different way, uh, with different cognitive capacities or different mm -hmm. antecedents of taste. You know, uh, if if somebody grew up with just the Beatles, for example, you know. Uh, the, the language of classical concert music might be a, a little uh, unusual to get used to, perhaps. Uh, I'm not saying hard, uh, because, you know, it shouldn't be. But um, uh, it, it, it might take a lot of adjustment. But um, uh, I, I guess the most that you can do, really, is to show how sincere you are. Uh, in wanting to share this material, this, this wonderful material that we have at our disposal, and uh, hoping that uh, people will come to you. But if you try to please everybody, you're going to go absolutely bonkers. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, you're, you're a big champion of composers like uh, Liszt and Godowski. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this period of, of, of particularly of this turn of the century, of the 20th, turn of the 20th century, and sort of what that brought to not just music, but to pianism as well. Um, well, it was, it was yeah. very exciting because, uh, first of all, I was exposed to it uh, again because of my dad, because uh, that's what he liked the most. Uh, he <laughs> was mostly attuned to the composers of the Romantic period, you know, Chopin and Liszt above, and Schumann above all else. Mm -hmm. But also, he loved uh, the pianists of the golden age. Uh, so, uh, meaning anybody who uh, ever recorded for 17 RPM records. And he collected as many of the reissues as he could find, which in Canada wasn't always easy. But, uh, mm -hmm. And there's a lot more now than, uh, than, than when he was alive. He, he, he died 25 years ago already. Um, so, because that's what played around the house the most often, uh, that's what I heard a lot of, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and um, it was it formed a large part of my musical education and my my sort of artistic feeling, which might explain a little bit why some of my tempi were so fast because <laughs> um, uh, there was a, a yeah minute, sure well, so the, uh, the, the, uh, there was a three-minute side for 10-inch records and a four-and-a-half-minute to five-minute side for right. 
a limit you know, for, for uh, 12 inch records, which meant that uh, sometimes you had to uh, uh, get to the goal pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> yes. At the expense perhaps of your musical, um, uh, what's the real one? Um, aims, I guess. So uh, mm -hmm. that's what you wanted. Uh, and uh, sometimes you had to, in the case of a long piece, you had to stop, you know, in a kind of an incongruous place because, you know, you had to, you had to it, it, the, the, because of the length of the siding, you had to change yeah. your record over. Um, but uh, this uh, is what I was largely nurtured on, uh, this kind of piano playing, because my dad didn't uh, care too much for contemporary pianists at the time. I, I, think, he, mm -hmm. I think he got better, I think, you know, with age. So, um, and that's also, I think, probably where I got my taste for uh, the sort of lesser known repertoire and all the, the little sort of bonbon miniatures that a lot of these pianists l enjoyed recording. Um, I can think of other pianists such as uh, Stephen Huff, uh, mm -hmm. who also, uh, I think, uh, uh, really, looks for you know outside repertoire and also grew up with with this with this kind of uh, with these kinds of recordings in the house and uh, and that's why he i think uh, composes often in that vein you know and, and there's been delightful results uh, so i'm not the only one but uh, I, th I think that has really encouraged me to look uh, for mm -hmm. that kind of repertoire and to, to write a little bit in that vein because those etudes, those early etudes that we mm -hmm. were earlier that I wrote are really an homage to um, the composer pianists of that period. Yeah. And the six of these etudes are arrangements uh, of other composers' music and I think a couple more are, are stylistic pastiches. So uh, there's only a few original pieces in the lot. So that tells yeah. you something. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, also, as, as you've said, it was also just such an innovative um, time in music history and such an innovative time um, for the piano as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I feel, I mean, how, where, I'm curious to hear your answer on where you feel the innovation lies now in, in music making and composing or for the instruments. It's a little embarrassing to talk about because I could be keeping up with what's being done now a lot more than, uh, than I actually do. Um, I do see that there is a return to excessive simplicity, which um, myself, I don't really subscribe to, and it, it really doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, doesn't, um, it, it doesn't really appeal to me is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I'm sure that there is there is some wonderful stuff you know being uh, being written you know. But uh, uh, ask me again, and maybe in two or three years, <laughs> I, uh, I, I I do feel bad about it. And uh, well, I mean, I, I I suppose the question is is almost more for you as a composer as well. I mean, in terms of I think just the act of composing is innovative because you're choosing to put something out that doesn't already exist. And I suppose that's more the direction of the question would be um, where that uh, that um, vigor comes from. And but well, I'll ask you again in two years. <laughs> one of the interesting things I, I, I think in, in, in this uh, in this line of thinking is that what is there left to say? You know, and are there ways left to say it? Uh, even given that the piano is an almost limitless uh, uh, font of a fount of color and possibilities, mm. to, to me, uh, to me personally, uh, although other people think differently, I mean the piano is really the most complete instrument there is. There are there are a lot of the re reasons to to love uh, other instruments other uh, uh, other than the piano, and I I perfectly uh, agree with that. But to, to my mind. The, the piano is really it for me. I mean, I wonder if that's a good enough segue to maybe have you show us an example of <laughs> all the ways that the piano is such an instrument, perhaps. Uh, uh, that, that's a, <laughs> you're forcing this on me a little. Uh, well, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't no, I won't force it on you. I haven't practiced just, today. I'd be a little just, bit better. 
sure. this instrument sitting behind you, but no, 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 I won't, I won't force anything on you. Ask me in about two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I would love to talk to you a little bit about, um, I think something that's really, we've already, we've spoken about the, how you've taken a relatively non-traditional path. It's certainly at the beginning going through a lot of the obscure repertoire. And I'm wondering if you faced challenges in this period um, and whether you faced uh, uncertainty and people um, thinking it wasn't, wasn't possible and what that maybe offered you um, artistically or, or yeah, how, how that journey was. I mean, are you, you mean about my whole career or about the... No, I mean, um, particularly at the beginning of your career when you were um, really choosing to program quite obscure repertoire and um, sort of... Yeah, uh, well, it, it was problematic because, um, well, the, 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 uh, the first big push that I had in my career was uh, winning a competition in 1985. It was the Carnegie Hall American Music Competition sponsored by the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. It had a whole of carnations after that and then it folded. Uh, but um, it did earn me uh, uh, a good string of engagements over a, a couple of years. Uh, and also I, uh, um, uh, auditions with managers were uh, organized for me, which was uh, really, really nice. And because it was the, <laughs> the, uh, the competition was uh, under the umbrella of Carnegie Hall, the auditions for managers were in the empty Carnegie Hall, the big stern stage in which was, uh, I didn't re realize my luck back then, <laughs> but <laughs> it was the first time I played in Carnegie Hall, just for maybe a, a handful of people. And uh, I did not make a good choice as far as uh, eventual management. And um, so the, and especially I think even then, you know, I uh, wanted to stray away from the uh, accepted repertoire, which, uh, which really wasn't a good idea. I wouldn't recommend anybody doing it the way I did. Um, so it was difficult for the management to really sustain a career. I mean, I mean, they 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 did it as well as they could, perhaps, you know. But still, they, they, I think they could have done better. Also, um, I think that uh, around that time or a little bit later, I started recording, and uh, I think that more than anything else got my name around, because mm -hmm. my, my concerts were still few and far between. Uh, in the early '90s, I was able to secure the the services of a really good manager who worked independently in. Uh, in London, and uh, the uh, my my career almost uh, I was I was active more there than here. Uh, um, fortunately, my I already had a name in Canada, so that wasn't a problem. I still had I had concerts in Canada, but the United States that really took a long time. Yeah, um, it, it's it's such an interesting um, journey that you've had. Uh, Something that um, has been coming up in the interviews and uh, during this series, which uh, I've enjoyed exploring, is is discussing what classical the, the evolution of classical music within society now, and what where where we are now, what the role of classical music is currently within society, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on that, particularly. Well, I, I hear. I've been hearing you know, that people are worried about a classical music attendance in um, um, uh, uh, generally, you know, is very much towards the, the senior citizens, you know, and there's a lot of white hair in the, in the audience, but, um, and they're saying, you know, what's gonna happen when these people, you know, uh, pass on. But the thing is, we've been saying that for decades and uh, and the 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 the, uh, the question has always remained, but uh, there, the answer is that there are, there is a renewal of of uh, listeners, and I don't think, for that uh, reason, that um, attendance for classical concerts is ever going to dwindle or even die. 
Um, uh, and it's a testimonial to the the unbelievable strength of the the repertoire that's offered to them. That, that um, uh, there's always going to be a need for it, a desire for people to see it. So I, I'm not worried in the least. And what do you feel your role is as an artist in that in society? I mean, it's just yeah. What do you feel? How, how do you feel? one should shape their role as an artist within society? I, it's a very simple answer. I'm just one of many uh, who uh, is, is just uh, helping things along. And uh, how can I say this? Uh, <laughs> I'm doing my bit, doing it as honestly as I can. And as I said, you know, I, I uh, it's very, it sounds very simplistic and perhaps maybe a little naive, I don't know, but all I want to do is share mm -hmm. uh, my discoveries with people or, or share, perhaps illuminate a little bit, uh, shed some light on what they already know, perhaps to, to make them see it uh, not willfully differently, but just maybe, uh, you know, a little secret. We all think we hold the truth. <laughs> so maybe I want to expose what I think the truth is. That, no, that's, no, no, forget that. That's very good. <laughs> very pretentious. Yeah. But I, I like that so much, though, that it's, it's A, playing your part, whatever, you know, and that, because then that makes you feel you're really a part of a society that needs everyone, that needs all sorts of people. Um, and and all sorts of artists, and then also um, to to share, just to simply share, to to share emotion and share an experience. And it's actually when you say it like that, it is a tremendously simple answer, and I, I really like that. Actually, <laughs> um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that as musicians. <laughs> Uh, that being said, of course, th that's not always easy to do because there there can be so many things standing in the way, and any of my colleagues will be in, in agreement with that. I mean, you you can have bad acoustics, a bad instrument, um, uh, a bad day, a, a bad day, exactly. You know, as far as uh, you you didn't eat right, you didn't sleep right, uh, or sure. what, whatever else. You know, you, you may be sick. And I've played, you know, with headaches. I've played with the flu, even. You know, um, I've played with colds many, many times. Um, but uh, music comes first, and uh, you have to just hide these things as much as you as you can. I think the only really visible result, uh, the only time that I can recall during my recitals when when I, people could really see something was wrong. Is that I was recovering from a cold, and I still had, uh, um, I, I was still coughing, and I, I was giving a recital for the uh, Chicago Symphony in uh, an orchestra hall over there, and I was in the middle of the first impromptu of Schubert from the second book, and I felt such an uncontrollable tickle in my throat that usually, usually you can hold these things, but I just had to cough, uh -huh. and coughing in the middle of Schubert is just such an insult. And oh, no. since I was playing the four impromptus, I actually had to excuse myself between the first and second and go, oh, off, no. go off stage and, and cough it up. It, it, it's something that I hope never happens again because <laughs> but doing, you know, that, doing that to sure feels so bad. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure the audience loved it because I think we all love to know that the person we're seeing on stage is a human. <laughs> so. well, I, at least I'm sure they got worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Marc Andre, this was just—it was such a delight having you here, and um, thank you so much for for sharing your thoughts. And um, is there anything else that you would like to to add, or that we didn't didn't discuss, or? No, this has been really, really wonderful. I mean, I, I really wanted to thank you for including me in your in your series. Oh, very. It's it's my honor. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much. Th thank you so much for joining us today. And um, for those of you who tuned in, uh, you can rewatch the episode. Re it'll stay uh, stay online. And I also um, curated a playlist today of 
of pianist composers, um, including quite a lot of obscure uh, ones. So uh, um, that's attached to the episode, which you can also listen to. And um, otherwise, thank you so much, Marc-Antoine. Thank wishing you. you. Wishing you a nice day. <laughs>